Hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. As a reminder, please keep your phones off and silent. It feels good to tell people that <laughs> after a year and a half of Zoom-only visit writers. Um, also, this is a masked event. I'm going to take my mask off because I'm at the lectern, and our visiting writer is welcome to do that. But for everyone else, please remember to keep your masks on. Also, um, as a CE credit, um, you all have signed in. I hope please stay for the duration of the event um, so you can get CE credit. My name is Dr. Clinton Crockett Peters. Thank you all again for being here tonight. Uh, this fall's David James Poinsant Endowed Creative Prose Series. This reading series wouldn't be possible without the generous support of people like you. Thank you so much to those of you who have donated to help make this a reality. And for those of you who have it, who would like to, please consider speaking to me, Dr. Sandra Meek, or Dr. Will Donnelly, uh, after the event about making a donation. And now, I would like to introduce a very special person, our visiting writer, J. Drew Langham. J. Drew Langham grew up in Edgefield, South Carolina, a county that from a map's eye view looks like, quote, a cartoonish chicken head, he writes in his memoir, The Home Flicks, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, which was recently named one of the best scholarly books of the decade by the Chronicle of Higher Education. As a boy, he grew up in what he calls, quote, the bird's scrawny neck. Surrounding young Drew was a rainbow of environments, soggy bottoms, barren rock, rich alluvial soil, rivers, sycamore oak, bald cypress, hackberry, and along, along with blooming red buds and dogwoods, and yes, blue red of the mountains. It was, he writes, quote, a hidden gem, a source of biodiversity that is easy to pass by on the way to somewhere else. To the north of his home was an Appalachian formation riddled with waterfalls dubbed the Blue Wall, a name that probably signifies azure fog, rolling backs of hills like cresting whales receding in the distance. But not long ago, it was called Dark Corner, where early white American frontiersmen and militias massacred Cherokees and were later Confederate deserters hit out. The diamondback rattlesnakes and gopher tortoises mosey on through this history along with the red uh, cockadet, Drew, did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Red diamond. <laughs> Woodpeckers who hammer tree life for their meals. Peregrine falcons, the fastest creatures anywhere in this wide, beautiful, brutal world, dip and scribble calligraphy in the sky as they catch and crush their prey. How do we get through the improbable, Drew asked on the podcast On Being with Krista Tippett. How do we square the duality of humanity and nature? A world where rose-crested crossbeaks and amazing, inspiring bobolinks and a place where wilderness is withheld from people because of trauma become landscape that landscape has become cemented in so many minds with slavery, genocide, and terror. Quote, it's not always easy, he said, it's an uphill hike in mud. But ask Drew about joy. Mention the birds you've found and loved, and he will share it. He's not demeaning to those who can't replicate his bird calls or his expertise. There's, quote, no shame in not knowing the name of a bird. Rather than reveling in snot and warding on high with his success as a writer and ornithologist, Drew finds and connects us to the natural world because this is a justice, too, to claim and live the inheritance that we know from science can be healing, relieving anxiety, physical pain, and even cancer. Drew, more than most writers I know, more than most people I know, recognizes the shadows and darkness underneath light in the forest, and the blue clouds and rolling hills and spearing peregrines soaring above dark corners, nature's eternal benevolence and cruelty. You cannot be a bird lover without recognizing how many of those levitating miracles fall dead every day, every night, from frost, famine, increasingly our own animal friends. Rather than ignore these myriad complicated tragedies, Drew finds joy through them, the miracles that soar above us, roost in our trees, and wake us up from dreams every day. Drew is a bird, a naturalist, and a self-proclaimed hunter-conservationist who has published essays and poetry in publications 
including the Best American Essays 2019, Orion Magazine, Audubon, Flycatcher, and in many, many other places. He is an alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology at Clemson, and he, is, and he and his family live in the upstate of South Carolina. Please, everyone, welcome with lots of applause, J. Jude Langham. Change, but wasn't quite sure where 
or how to satisfy that desire. In the midst of this yearning, I took a group of graduate students to Warren Wilson, a small working hands liberal arts college in the mountains of Western North Carolina. I took them there to see the preeminent conservationist, conservation biologist, E.O. Wilson. I am not a star chaser, but Dr. Wilson, a fellow Southerner and naturalist, is a supernova, a once in a generation mind whose ideas shine like the sun in the conservation world. He introduced the ideas of biodiversity and biophilia to the world. To me, he's on par with Aldo and Rachel. I didn't want to miss the chance to see him, and some of the students felt the same. As we gathered in the chapel, as we gathered in the chapel that night, the pews were overflowing. We found a few vacant spots on the floor in front. Dr. Wilson, a tall, slim, gray-haired grandfather of a man, soon emerged and mounted a pulpit. that looked like the bow of a ship. Standing above, but almost within the audience, he spoke softly of the need to notice nature. There weren't any statistics, any graphs, or scatter plots. There were no slides or pictures of devastated forests and animals dying in traps. His voice, even amplified through a microphone, never rose above the quiet surge of low tide surf. Yet, he was irresistibly compelling, magnetic. I was entranced. I looked around, and everyone else was drawn in, too. There were nods of approval, and more than a few eyes glistened with tears. It was church like I had never quite imagined it. There was no damnation or guilt, but simply a heartfelt plea to notice, to nurture, to care. After the talk, I approached Dr. Wilson to thank him for sharing his brilliance and to ask for an autograph. I don't recall much of what he said, but I do remember the deepest and kindest gaze. It was a caring look that made me feel singular in a room full of admirers. In my book, he drew a tiny ant alongside his signature. Just as that creature had sparked his great passions, that evening planted a seed of what might be in me. A few years later, I spent several springs in northern Vermont writing and thinking about nature in a different way. In that strange place, my right brain flickered back on. The need to impress other professors, to pile up peer-reviewed publications, and cash grant dollars began to give way a bit to a desire for a different consciousness. Vermont was the greenest place I'd ever been. It was also a place where no one knew me. In that freedom, my stress-tightened shoulders dropped, and the tension in my jaw lessened. I slowed down and walked dirt roads, sometimes barefoot than empty-minded, with not much more in my head than the present moment. Warbling vireos and leased flycatchers were the only audiences I entertained. Within the past few years, I've given fewer and fewer p-value presentations. More and more, I find myself taking the hard data and wrapping it in genuine caring. The science is critical. I call it the scripture. It always comes first. But action ultimately has to come behind it. I try to connect the conservation dots. Aldo Leopold's admonitions to be one of those 
who cannot live without wild things, to keep all the parts, to listen to the mountain, and to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. All of these thoughts fly round and round inside my head like swift swirling before the roost. The words are blocks of inspiration that I want to migrate from my mouth into the heads and into the hearts of others. I shake hands less now and hopefully will give more hugs soon. I exchange more heartbeats than business cards. The energy is palpable. I can feel the brackish bay marsh tide rising and the prairie wind sweeping through crowds that crave it. I often see the full moon's glow in kindred spirits' eyes. So if teaching is a kind of preaching, I've become a warmer, gentler pastor. Maybe it's appropriate that those years have given me new spiritual release. I've settled into a comfortable place with the idea of nature and God being the same thing. Evolution, gravity, change, and the dynamic transformations of field into forest move me. A warbler migrating over hundreds of miles of land and ocean to sing in the same tree once again is as miraculous to me as any divided sea. Doing good things for and revering nature are just acts. There is righteousness in conserving things and staving off extinction and simply admiring the song of some bird whose name you may not even know. In my moments of confession in front of strangers, talking of my love for something much greater than any one of us, I become a freer me. Each time I am reborn. For all those years of running from anything resembling religion and all the scientific training that tells me to doubt anything outside of the prescribed confidence limits, I find myself to find these days more by what I cannot see than what I can. As I wander into the pre-dawn dark of an autumn wood, I feel the presence of things beyond my own flesh and bone and blood. My being expands to fit the limitlessness of the wild world. My senses flush to full and my heartbeat quickens with the knowledge that I am not alone. And so here I am, right? <laughs> It's always an, an odd place to be. Gosh, I hated pews uh, so much as a kid. I could not tell you um, how hard the pews in Jeter Baptist Church were. Um, and, and so I used to sit in those pews, and um, you know we would have church fans, right? Um, Jeter did not have this, this little country Black Baptist Church, never had, only got air conditioning, I think, a few years ago. Um, but I would, my favorite fan, a couple of the fans scared me. The Jesus fan scared me because he stared back at me. Um, the MLK fan always said it because I knew what had happened to him. There was a history on the back of that fan. But then there was this fan with this little white church in an autumn wood, right? And I always imagined myself in that little white church in that autumn wood, but I had escaped outside into that brilliant foliage. And so to be here tonight after reading that story about E.O. Wilson in that moment was really a moment of transformation. It was a transformation that didn't necessarily change how I thought, but, but really, I think, allowed me, gave me permission 
validate a way of thinking, not to be dismissive of my scientific training, but really to begin to arc, to short circuit the hemispheres of my brain, to bring one thinking and one knowing into another thinking and into another knowing. And so that's what I try to do as, as a writer. Um, I want to try to bring my knowing as a scientist to those who may not have an ology at the end of several degrees, right? Um, I, I want people to be able to understand climate change before the sea laps around their ankles. I want people to think about the <laughs> billions of birds that have died without having to name hundreds of them. And so, as a writer, we're sort of translators, I think, in a way. And that is part of what Dr. Wilson did for me that night. So, um, I did want to share, as I, <laughs> as I came in, and, and Clint told me that there are officially more deer than students here. Um, I wanted to share a poem, and I, it's funny because how many of you heard of a golden shovel? Kind of poem, right? They're fun, they're challenging. Golden shovel essentially is taking somebody else's work and, and then using it in a format to form your own poem. Um, I'm not going to read you the golden shovel I wrote, but I'm going to read you this poem that really again was sort of this transformative thing for me. And it was transformative for me. Um, by the way, the name of that essay that I just read is called New Religion. New Religion. Um, I was attending, uh, Vermont has been a very special place for me. Um, if, if you, uh, I'm not a good, I'm not good at remembering quotes, but, but um, Samuel Clemens, uh, Mark Twain, um, once said something about travel. Uh, being anathema to, to xenophobia, to hate. Um, and sometimes the way that I look at life, especially my travel, is to look at it as an experiment, right? Home is the control. Travel is the experiment, right? And then we do the analysis over those miles and those, that distance. But um, I was attending um, this, this, uh, this whole thinking retreat at Basin in Vermont, and once again, I found myself in this unfamiliar place. Again, people sitting in a dimly lit circle. How many people have ever walked into a room with people sitting in a dimly lit circle and you walk the other way? <laughs> well, writers love sitting in circle. And, um, and, and at this, this uh, whole thinking retreat where, I, I mean, the first place that I had to haul this oversized bag was up this tremendous slope to a yurt. And, uh, and then I came back down, sort of flustered from the travel, from the day, and a man named Stephen Glazer quoted a portion of this poem to me. I'll read the whole poem. It's called How to See Deer by Philip Booth, a uh, main poet, the late Philip Booth. Forget roadside crossings. Go nowhere with guns. Go elsewhere your own way, lonely and wanting. Or stay and be early next to the woods. Inhabit old orchards. All clearings promise. Sunrise is good and fog before sun. Expect nothing always. Find your love slowly. Wait out the windfall. Take your good time to learn to read ferns. Make like a turtle downhill toward slow water instructed by Heron. Drink the pure silence. Be compassed by wind. If you quiver like aspen, trust 
your quick nature. Let your ear teach you which way to listen. You've come to assume protective color. Now colors reform to new shapes in your eye. You've learned by now to wait without waiting, as if it were dusk. Look into light falling in deep relief. Things even out. Be careless of nothing. See what you see. So I saw a lot of deer. Um, and I didn't have to really try hard. Um, but, but then I sat, and in that gloaming, in that gloaming, those, those silhouettes, those live silhouettes, became art. These lives. So um, I had a question um, the other day of, of the books or uh, those things that I have close by to inspire me. And, and that is a poem that stuck with me because what Stephen Blazer did that night is I came in again with my shoulders up, sort of angry, and back then it was like 2G reception, right? It's against the law to have cell phone reception in Vermont, I think, <laughs> at least in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, but as I walked into that room and, and people were back in that, in that corner um, sitting in a circle, dimly lit, You know, he, he told me um, to find my luck slowly. So that sticks with me. That poem has stuck with me. And, um, and it's a calming influence in my life. So the deer made me think of that again. So um, Dr. Peters and I agree that I, 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 I hope you have lots of great questions. Um, or comments. I'll share a couple more pieces. I want to share, I love to share things that I, that are new, um, that are sometimes are just, uh, just, uh, just taken out um, from, uh, for a test drive, or that are about to be published. This was a request from a friend to write about a day in the life um, that will be that will be published. It's not a long piece, but it gave me a great deal of joy to write it. And Stephen, um, you know, when he when he asked that, when he told me to to find my luck slowly, um, again, it, it was a this moment of breathing. And Clint asked me tonight if reading gave, gives me joy. No one's ever asked me. So thank you for that. And I think it's important for us to find those things that give us joy. This is called a day in the life. <clears throat> a day of days. This day is those days which are these days of many hued leaves leaving. These are the days that wind came in and rattled Fall's cage, stripped the maples and poplars nude of saffron and scarlet, but left wrinkle-soiled clothes on beaches and oaks. These are the days of white-throated sparrows arriving in the backyard to sing of old Sam Peabody's poverty-stricken Canadian times. These are the days of the deer chasing, of bucks antler rubbing, of does white tails lifting, of future fawn making the convergent intersected result. These are the days of me wishing I was watching them ghost through at dawn. Of me wishing I was waiting until dusk for them to reappear. Of me wishing I was above it all, voyeuring into wood's lust. These are the days of the beaver moon hiding behind Earth's shadow. Me getting out of a warm bed at 2 a.m. to see it turn a pinker shade of pale. It is the day of me howling 
to myself. This is the day that becomes the days of stress coming, of expectation swelling, of perfection failing, of familial ailing. These days are the holidays. These are the days of true friend revelations. These are the days of double dose vaxing, of boosting, of hoping that odd costs are just odd costs. These are the days of still masking. These are the days of wondering why black lives don't matter beyond marches or unarmed Negroes dying. These are the days that was one day of despairing multiplied into too many and knowing that justice is an ephemeral thing laying at the intersection of jurisprudence and luck of 12 jurors drawn. These are the days of the very last leftive or Katie did half humming. These are the days of witnessing black birds gathering, flocking, peppering bruised purple evening sky, feathered barometers as accurate as any meteorological coin flip. These are the days of autumn becoming winter before winter is official. These are the days of winter wrens and wood piles chattering not caring whether it is winter or not. These are the days of kinglets ruling over thickets with ruby and golden crowns. These are the days of first frosts, of sapsuckers mewing like arboreal cats. These are the days of cuddling a real cat, a tabby cat, a purring tabby cat that trusts my lap for a few moments of napping. This is the day I envy feline relaxation technique. This is the day to be a cocky cat. These are the days when Christmas moves to the front of the hyper-capitalistic line and any other holiday gets bumped to the back of our minds. These are the days that once tender summer green gets bit by below 32 degrees and curled to crispy brown. These are the days of second and then third cup coffee. These are the days of cardinals being redbirds, of juncos being snowbirds, of flickers being yellowhammers, of vultures being buzzards. These are the days of my grandmother's ornithology. These are the days of flip-flops, of chili toes and fleece vests for warming. These are the days of my ashy ankles needing more lotion. This is the day I don't care what my ashy ankles look like. These are the days that the mustard greens get bitter and taste best. The days of rutabaga bottoms mashed to a pulp and boiled purple top turnips, rich with butter. These are the days of deep fried turkeys and cornbread dressing, never ever stuffing. These are the days of sweet potato pie because pumpkins are for jack-o'-lanterns and fake coffee flavorings. This is not the day to visit the scale. These are the kitty corner days, the nearby far away days, the days of converting Celsius to Fahrenheit and back. Why? Because zero ain't always zero and 32 can be hot as hell. These are the days of ellipses and words never written but thought. These are the days between warblers and waterfowl, between butterbutt yellow rumps in the myrtle bush and butterball bubbleheads on the farm pond. These are the days of doing downward facing dog with a non napping cat alongside. <laughs> this is the day I thought of tadpoles and puddles as commons that made me pause as a boy and still do as a grown man. These are the days of goldenrod, the color of sun, of sumac, red as blood. These are the mellow days of minor chord, wringing tears from my head. These are the days of chipmunk hoarding scurry. These are the days of take your time, but hurry, because there's not enough time. These are the days when slop fat pigs used to wonder how long it would be before the judgment day came and it was the end of their reign, that the sharp knife and the heavy axe and the boiling vat would be their end. These are the days when November thinks of retiring. These are the days all wrapped into one. 
this is a day in my mind, a day in my life. What date, you ask? Yesterday, maybe tomorrow? I can't remember now. Each present has become yesterday way too fast. Tomorrow is today already. This day, past tense to that. All of this swirls before I wake or in a dream or between yoga mat and shower and first call from someone wanting something I procrastinated doing. This is a day of another Zoom. There is something due this day, I'm pretty sure. Perhaps it is what you read or hear now, perhaps not. Here it is anyway for your perusal, for your ear. This day is singularly plural. This is the day I dared write down what one day of musing is like. The day I thought about who, what, where, and when brings peace to my life. And who, what, where, and when shreds my life to pieces. This is the day of a single sigh of an exhale, the day of hoping to take in another so as to keep the stream of consciousness flowing. This is my day of days. So, <laughs> so I, would, I would love to take um, questions. It's, um, it's, it's always dangerous when you get faculty um, up before people and you realize that there are people in the room who are going to get credit for it, <laughs> right? And so you're like, uh, how many, how long before final exams? And you know what? I will tell you, and I know, I know how it is, but I, I will tell you as I drive around campus uh, back home at Clemson, First of all, everybody's heads are always in their phones. Um, but now people are walking headlong into cars. <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, be careful, take care of yourselves. Right? It's only a test. Take care of yourselves. I mean, I, I see I see you been there. So as you walk around, pull your head up a little bit, breathe, right? And understand where you are and why you are. Find a little bit of peace in where you are. Realize your blessing of being here, of breathing, right? Because that's the test. Not what anybody puts in front of you on a desk. Cool. Questions, anybody? Right? 
So the simple exercise in thinking about how environmental justice and civil rights, right, um, social justice, how those things converge, try marching and not breathing. Right? Try living and not eating. Try protesting and not drinking water or having clean water to drink. So same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same faith. And, and in that grandiose idea that founding fathers wrote only for certain people, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that didn't apply to them. Because at that point in time, I was only three-fifths of a human being. They agreed on that, many of them. So when I look at environmental justice and, 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 and civil rights, I, I merge those because, you know, as those people that were deemed three-fifths were building this country, that those people who were deemed as savages had been killed off and moved off of land so that people could call it wildness, right? Think about that. How do you separate that? You can't. You can. Um, and so I, I always sort of, um, I, I say, yes, for me, they, they come under that, that mantra that, of same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same faith. And ultimately, even though those people in Flint ain't drinking the same water that they're drinking in Ann Arbor, eventually they will be. Eventually they will be. Because that, that water that rises in the lower ninth ward to make life unlivable, that climate change visits on the poorest first, right? Ultimately, that water will find its way behind the gated community. So, I can't separate those. And I think it's important for us, um, you know, as we think about policy, to think about um, nature not as privilege, um, but as certainly as necessity, certainly as, as um, is, is, is water, is, drink, is, is, is potable drinking water a privilege? Should it be a privilege? Should it be a right? So, um, you know, the canaries in the coal mine, whatever you want to call them, are dropping dead by the billions. Everyone knows of the metaphor or of the, the case of the canary in the coal mine, right? You know, as miners would take these wild, these canaries into the cages, as, as the, the levels of noxious gases um, got to be too much, the birds stopped singing. And someone was always listening, right, to know whether this bird was singing. And when that bird stopped singing, it was time to get out of the mind. Well, not only have the birds stopped singing, but they're disappearing. So what does that mean for us? What does it mean that the least, that some would consider the least of, of us, Right? We have to be careful where we jog. What does that mean? So, that's outdoors. That's outdoors. That's, that's the birds that we don't have to have field guides to name, but recognizing that they're no longer singing is, is enough for us to take civil rights, environmental justice, social justice, and all of it becomes this amalgam, right? Those are the monuments that we need to be building. And thinking about how we bring those things together, because as much as, 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 much as we might think that, that we'll never live in Flint, just wait. How many rivers in Georgia how many rivers in Georgia are illegal? What percentage of rivers? Why is Georgia and why is the state of Georgia <laughs> um, trying to get water out of Tennessee and South Carolina?
So as you think about those things, as you think about what people have, um, as we think about nature, I think we tend to put nature over here and we've siloed it, but nature is as close as the next meal for many of us. So that's the way I like to think about it. Um, and, and, and for me, if we, if we, those organizations that are tasked, that have tasked themselves with saving birds or beasts or other things, to expand beyond the birds and the beasts to human beings, you don't diminish in any way those, those, those non-human beings, but you connect us. And if we begin to be connected, I think it's going to, I think that convergence is going to be healthier. Thank you for the question. Hi, so I really love that last piece you just read and the day in the life. And so I was wondering if I'd like to hear a little bit more about the process of that one because you said a friend wanted you to write that day in the life. So I was wondering if that was like a very stream of consciousness current poem that you like wrote in this manner, like a day, like was this thing that just flew out, or if you like worked over a course of a long period of time to create that. Thank you. Great, great process question. I, you know, um, Clint and I were talking about this before. This is <laughs> this is where I write ninety nine percent of my poems, and um, and so I, I write there because stream of conscious can flow through this, right? And a lot of times where I am, I can't get a signal. So uh, there's you know that that particular piece. I was really sort of struggling because honestly, I had forgotten that it was coming due. <laughs> and, um, and, and the editor who had requested it said, here's a reminder. And I had asked her, I said, can you just give me a couple of reminders because I got a lot of deadlines. And so what I started doing, um, it was just, I love litany. I love litany. And, and, and part of where, quite honestly, I got that was as I was sitting in pews listening to preachers, um, they, they would fall into litany. And, and that litany was a way, it was sing song. And so I love, I love the lyrical. And so that really just sort of fell out. You know, the cat, the, the, you know, and, and all of it is experience, all of it, there, there was, there was, there was nothing in that poem that I'm thinking about, or in that piece that I'm thinking about now, in that prose poem, that I had not experienced. And so, yeah, very, very stream of conscious, um, there, there was little editing, but part of what happens to a piece like that is that that there are things that are added in, but e or even as I read it, that um, and there are poets in here that I'm sure that will tell you as they read their poetry. Or do you, are you a poet? So do you do you read? Oh, yeah. Do you perform? So that performative part of it. How many times have you been up and you decided, you know what, this I'm going to add this. I'm going to take this away. You know that's the that's the, the fun part of a piece like that. So thank you for thank you for asking. Very stream of conscious. And, and again, for any questions, I always promise one hundred percent response. I don't promise answers, but responses. <laughs> so early this year, I think it was in like February, over social media, there was a giant thread where people realized that a lot of birds have really goofy names, and that ornithologists had a sense of humor. So what's your favorite goofy birthday? Oh gosh, my favorite goofy birthday? Oh wow, I have never gotten that question. Um, it's, it's a little morose, but the, the, the favorite, well, Will just introduced me to a new bird name, a colloquial name for barred owls, which is um, rain owl, which now I have to catalog. Um, you know, I, I think for me it's probably butcher bird. So loggerhead shrikes, which um, used to be pretty abundant birds. You know, it's a bird that you probably would have seen on the edge of fields around here. Um, but they're called butcher birds because they're they're passerines, they're songbirds, um, but they they're raptorial. 
in that they, they capture large insects like liver grasshoppers, they'll capture small mammals like shrews, deer mice, fence, they'll capture fence lizards, um, frogs and toads, and occasionally small sparrows, um, small birds. And because their feet are not strong enough to, to grasp that prey, they'll impale their, their prey on thorns or barbed wire which led to them being persecuted by people who thought they were cruel birds. So it's a bird that lives two lives. It's a code switcher. How many of you know what a code switcher is? So birds like that, that I can relate to is a code switcher. So it's, that bird is a passerine, but then it's also sort of, it has this raptoral nature, this raptorial nature. And so it lives these two lives. And part of the reason that the bird declined is that in the first half, really, of the 20th century, people would shoot them because they just saw them as harmful birds, as injurious birds. They're declining now in part because of habitat. The butcher bird is, a, is pretty cool. So that's my point. There, there are other goofy bird names. Um, there are a lot of goofy bird names, but that's the one that I can think of right now. Thank you for the question. I wondered who are some of the writers that you would put on your list of the ones who most reveal a love of nature. You mentioned Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. You mentioned E.O. Wilson. I think of people like Marty Murray, oh, Mary gosh. Oliver. Yes. Tell us some that we might have missed besides yourself, <laughs> <laughs> which I would add, I would add to the list, but some others that. Uh, Reveal that pure love of nature that inspires us to do something because we love it, not because we fear what's going to happen. Right, yeah, that, that beauty in nature, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, for, for me, it is, gosh, there's, there's so many. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with quote-unquote home in Georgia, Janice Ray. If you don't know Janice Ray's work, the Ecology of Cracker, and so much more than that, um, Janice, Ray, Janice just writes beautifully. And what I love to hear from Janice is I love to hear Janice read. I love to hear that jaw relax. And I, I, she can say all to my hall a thousand times. And I, just, um, I just melt. Um, so Janice, Janice Ray, another Georgia native, Sean Hill, a poet, um, black man uh, from Milledgeville, who um, writes beautiful, beautifully about nature and other things, but um, Sean is now in, in Helena, Montana, but from Milledgeville, Georgia, Sean Hill. Um, Camille Dungey, uh, who is uh, a poet, out of uh, Colorado, Colorado State. Now, Nikki Finney, um, a poet. Um, you mentioned Mary Oliver, uh, John, my friend John Lane, who is uh, I call him the I call him the poet laureate of the Southern Piedmont, um, but writes about so so much so much more. Um, Robin Wall Kimmel. We read Braiding Sweetgrass, but more importantly than reading Braiding Sweetgrass, listen to Robin read the words because she gets the Potawatomi right. So I, I love listening to, to writers. George Washington Carver, um, who wrote a lot about nature, but people want to just call him Professor Peanut, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and, and so, the, those are some of the authors that I just think of. Robert McFarlane, the, the Brits, um, the, the Brits aren't in as much despair as Americans are. And, and, and one of the things, and it's not that they have accepted the plight, but still finding beauty in nature, finding beauty to celebrate, right? Um, and, and it's not that, and I, and I think about where we are now, and I think about um, you know, I think about all the funerals that my grandmother used to drag me to, and people would talk about it being a celebration. I'm like, what are you celebrating? 
right? Well, I mean, you know, in different traditions, people do celebrate something in the midst of despair. And I think we need to find that beauty. So Robert McFarlane, um, there's, a, there's a British author who wrote about Peregrine Falcons um, named J.A. Baker. If you ever, and J.A. Baker was an insurance, he, was a, he sold car insurance but never owned a car. <laughs> but he, he wrote so densely about Peregrine Falcons on the British Moors that it's hard to get through five pages without just closing the book and, and, and reading because you hold your breath as you're reading the density of that. So those are, are um, um, a, a few. Um, yeah, that, that, that just sort of pop off, you know, sort of in my head now. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm leaving out lots of people but those are those are a few that I would look up. But then I would I would use those as sort of um, as sort of doors to, to other places. I always recommend, you know, I talked about Camille and, and, and Nikki um, and Sean. There's a book called The Colors of Nature. Find that anthology, right? Um, because what it really does is to put in place um, how others see nature how others see nature. You mentioned the goofy bird names. I had a wonderful interaction with um, a Lakota friend who I had been talking about meadowlarks. And, um, and he wrote me, and this was from a Facebook post, and he said, you know, meadowlarks um, to, to us are messengers. They would tell us when people were coming. And I'd never heard that. And so I'd like to say everybody has a bird story even if it's the chicken you ate last night or the pigeon that pooped on your car. That's a bird story. We just have to be willing to listen, and both of those are nature stories. Right? So you can, you can find in, in, in so much, um, you know, I, I fall back to the simplicity of frost a lot. Right? I, you know, I, I go back to to those, to those kinds of, 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 of places. But I love finding people writing about nature who we don't suspect would write about. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about the deeper meaning. I heard that you mentioned it in the poem that you were um, reading. Now, you, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get I just wanted to ask about the beaver moon. Is, oh, that's all. I just wanted to ask if you yes. see it in totality. So the, the lunar eclipse, that was a beaver moon. So, um, you know, the moon before that was the hunter's moon. And, you know, in these full moons, you have harvest moon, beaver moon, wolf moon, um, that some of them, some of them are allegedly named by indigenous, but some of those, you know, like the harvest moon, the, the harvest moon is interesting to me because um, the harvest moon <laughs> culturally was a moon that sometimes when the last cotton crop was brought in. So, so imagine out be it out in the field of cotton. First of all, the cotton is what, white? And then on a bright moonlit night, you don't get that night off. So when I think of a harvest moon, that's what I think of. A big, you know, the, the beaver moon, I'm not exactly sure there are several derivations for the beaver moon. You know, when beaver are supposedly building, when beaver are best trapped, all those kinds of things. So, um, but I, I like to, you know, when I write, I want to find a way to, to talk about things that would make someone ask a question. I would say, well, what, what is it? So the next time you go out and you look up at that big, bright orb in the sky, it's more than just the moon, right? I thought of that, you know, and I'm not the first person to think of it, but I always see in the moon, I always see this belly light. Right? 
And I always imagine what's behind the moon. So when you look at, when you see constellations, you, then, you can then begin to imagine how people were seeing figures behind those constellations. Now those constellations that we're seeing are coming from certain tradition. But when you begin to ask other people what they see, it's amazing what you, what you learn and what they see. My grandmother used to talk about the blood moon all the time. And she talked about the blood moon um, as a foreboding of the end of times. See, I learned to read in part from the book of Revelations. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, she would, she would, she would say the moon is bloody tonight. You know, um, that means end times are coming. And so when I look to the sky, sometimes, or you hear me talk about my grandmother's ornithology, you know, she didn't have rain owls. She had rain crows, which are yellow little cuckoos. She didn't have, she didn't have eastern kingbirds. She called them bee martins. She didn't have great horned owls, she had cat owls or big owls. She didn't have bob white quail, she had partridges. She didn't have juncos, she had snowbirds. You know, and sparrows were always a bird to point to and say, God's eyes on that bird. So, you know, the moon just sort of becomes one of the, you know, we talk about this litany of things. Um, the moon becomes another object to think about in this sort of different way or as a writer or a poet, just for you to imagine it in a different way. One of the fun things to do, um, especially in the spring, in May, April, May, um, and then in the fall here, September, mid-September to, to mid-October, on a full moon, if you go out and you have a, you know, someone who has a spotting scope, or sometimes you can just do it with the bare eye. But to put that scope, like a low power telescope on the moon, and to see birds fly across it at night. It's, called, it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing to see, um, you know, these lives that are going on that we never think about. And you'll see sometimes flocks of birds fly across the full moon. Um, sometimes a single bird that you can even recognize. And then for me, on that night, when I can recognize a thrush, I don't know whether it's a hermit thrush or a Swainson's thrush or a wood thrush, but for me, on that night, I claim thrush the thrush moon. So that's one of the beautiful things that writing enables us to do, to be creative. So, Beaver moon. I like to think of it as maybe the moon when beavers are out gathering saplings to repair dams. Does that help? Thank you for the question. Very good. So I did have a completely different question, but then you said you learned to read from the Book of Revelations. So I'm going to hold on back to that for a second. Uh, <laughs> I have heard a lot of sort of, I guess, religious meaning and inspiration for your work. I was wondering maybe how much of an effect would you say that the religious experience of growing up kind of takes part in your writing about nature? Wow. Um, thank you. A good bit. You know, again, it's, um, I tell people on any, on every day, every day, I go from atheist to Zen and back. And skipping a lot of stuff in the middle, but it, it, it was important, um, you know, especially in the in the in the black church, um, sort of this so, you know having this social construct. Uh, back in the day, at where I'm from, our church was so small you only met once every month. Jeter was a first Sunday church, so. I came to know God, as I say, as a first Sunday guy. And because that church only met once a month, 
you'd be in church from, and sometimes they'd have Sunday school, sometimes they wouldn't. But let's say they had Sunday school at 10. You would get out at 3. Because, you know, you got to fill up all those other Sundays on that one Sunday. So um, sitting there in that hard pew, looking at that church band and imagining um, was, 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 I think, in part, sort of honed my imagination to be able to sort of go inside scenes and to, and to bring those scenes out. But then, I, you know, my, my grandmother was very religious, but she was also extraordinarily superstitious. So there was this convergence of Christianity and mysticism. And she talked to dead people every night. I mean, every night. There were dead people visiting the bedroom where we slept. So, um, you know, all of that brought me, has brought me now to a place of, of thinking about some of the things that she said, because I think about what she would think now. And I can't help, you know, the past year and a half, um, yeah, I, I, I do, I, I talk about plagues. And, and that might seem overplayed, but I don't think so, right? I don't, I don't think so. And I, and I think about her verbiage and what she would have said, and I'm really glad that she's not around. I'm really glad that, that people, my grandmother was born in 1896. I'm, I'm really glad that, that, um, that she was not around to see virtual reality. To have to look at some contrivance and wonder whether it's real, right? I mean, because I think about her being a child and and seeing an airplane fly and how that must have been sort of. But then I remember sitting in front of her tiny television that wasn't much bigger than this iPad, and we watched the lunar landing. And I remember her being just wowed by that. So her religion isn't my religion, um, but her spirit in many ways is my spirit, if that makes sense. And so I try to see beyond what is known. For, for, for me as a scientist, the unanswered question is job security. You know, wonder falls in the gaps between what we know and what we don't know. So there's, and, and my grandmother was always full of wonder. No, I would not teach anyone I know to read out of Revelations. Um, but then there were these passages um, that that she would that she would have me read that were just that that were absolutely beautiful. Right? And so to recognize um, the literary, for example, in some of what um, she had me read sort of inspires me in a different way. So I'll tell you, it, it's, it's not easy to climb up in a pulpit. It's not because, I mean, that's not, that's not, maybe it's everybody's place or maybe it's not, um, but I, man, my grandmother constantly, constantly used to tell me that I was going to preach. Constantly, and I and and and, and it's something. Um, you know, and so I, I'm at a meeting one one day on a panel, it was a conservation panel, and I hadn't seen like the materials and everything, and I get to my seat and I go to, to pick up the program, and it has on it, um, Dr. J. Drew Lamb, conservation evangelist. And I was like, what, what is this? Where did this come from, right? So, um, She also used to say, you can run, but you can't have it. So I say all that to say that so much of what she did and said is in some ways coming to fruition.
And I can't deny that. I can't deny that part of me. So whatever I call myself, right, um, you know, I, I, I have to lean on, as they say, who she was and what she taught me. And it gives me chills down my back as I sit here saying that. Because, you know, as we were talking, Will and I were talking beforehand, you know, before I, I'll do an owl call, I, I take just a, a brief moment, most people won't notice it, to, to, to ask her forgiveness because those were bad omen words for her. And she would not have liked me mocking owls. She would have thought I was trying to bring bad luck in. Um, so, I talk about my grandmother a lot. I talk about... Um, not so much religion, maybe, but but spirituality, and um, because I, I think it's I think that portion of us that we can't quite tell what it is, right? We can't quite get a grasp on what makes me cry that a fool would, or what makes my what makes me. <laughs> What, what makes me sob at a sunset? Right? You know, you ever had that moment? And you're just like, man, this is just beautiful. This is worship worthy right now. And you sit there, and I'm, I'm coming in, driving in today down, what is it, Georgia 53? And I don't know the name of that ridge that the sun was setting over, but it was this hogback, and the sun had illuminated every tree on that ridge. And it was just beautiful. And in this moment of, of having come through 285 West and bumper to bumper traffic, there in my windshield was something worship worthy. And so in that moment, it became a God. So, you know, she wouldn't agree with that. She would say, well, you can't have me. And I would say, well, I wouldn't argue with her. I would just, but, you know. So those, so those moments, I think, of her sort of having me in this place to think about something larger than me expands me and gives me the ability to wonder. To wonder. And that's important for a writer, I think. I've, I've tried writing poetry with P values. I've tried modeling poetry, no, I haven't. But people have, right? And, and nothing against models or, or art or, um, or statistics. I'm not saying that. But to be able to take that that we don't find statistically significant is sometimes spiritually significant. You know, the outlier can torque a data set. Everybody knows that, right? So sometimes to grasp that, what being a poet allows me to do is not, is to grab that outlier out of the statistical trash bin and write it. And so I can retrieve data that might not be useful to someone else, but that one thrush that is flying across the moon, and then the next morning I get up and I'm going into the office and laying dead at a window is a thrush that flew into a window of a building that was built without thinking about birds killing themselves on windows. Guess what? Suddenly that thrush that I saw across that thrush moon and that thrush that I'm holding in my hand that just died because it saw metaphorical sky in that window, they're the same. Prove they are. <laughs> Prove it. So that, that's the one. That's where what she taught me as a spiritual being helps me. Now, I'm not sure whether I answered your question or not. 
but that's that's how it, that's that's how it goes. Um, hey, I think we need to wrap things up, but before we do, um, and not to anger your grandmother, but could you give us some calls? Because I know you're good at it. Yeah, I'll try. Um, Just to put you on the spot. Sure. So, so I, I'll give a sparrow. Let's see. Um, so, white-throated sparrows should be on. They should be on campus. Now, they've been in for a couple of weeks. Find the scrubby sort of kind of shrubbery, right? They like that. Um, but the mnemonic, you know, people say they're, they're saying. Uh, for Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Canadians like to say they're saying, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. Um, so I say, you know, the white throated sparrows are opining poor Canadians. song that you'll hear this time of year and for me it's man it's 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 uh, winter um, another sparrow pinewood sparrow um, backman sparrow I call it pinewood sparrow because that's the better name for it it doesn't have to be named after a hateful person um, but it's a it's a sparrow that you'll find in piney woods actually in this part of the state um, piney woods that have been burned through um, that are sort of um, savannas, and it's um, and that song just lilts through the pines, just lilts. So when I close my eyes and I hear and I think of pinewood sparrow, I can smell that. Um, Bard out. Thank you all for being here. Uh, great to see you guys. Uh, good luck with the finals.